Good evening. My name is Liz Kruger. I'm a state senator. And today we're having a virtual town hall meeting on conspiracy theories. This is being taped on Thursday, March 18th. You might be watching it sometime after on some kind of streaming device. So I'll start out the way I usually start out with welcome and introductions. I want to welcome you all who are participating either through Zoom or through Facebook or who are calling into the roundtable discussion today. Remember, if you're calling on your phone, you have to keep it on mute. Before I get to today's proceedings, I want you to be aware that we have closed captioning for people with hearing issues. As a viewer, you have to activate the closed captioning to view the, the text on your device. If you're in Zoom, click on live transcript in the meeting controls to start viewing closed captioning. If you're in Facebook's live event, you will see a settings button on the bottom right hand corner of the video. Click closed caption CC to start viewing closed captioning. Before we begin, I want to give you some quick vaccine updates since we all live in this world of COVID and we want to know as much on time information as we can. As of March 10th, New Yorkers who are 60 years old or over without underlying health conditions are now eligible to get vaccinated. You can look for vaccination appointments at participating pharmacies here at the Javits Center in Manhattan and at the New York City vaccine hubs. So it's not just people under 60, now it's everybody from 60 up and people with health conditions. Starting Wednesday, March 17th, the following New Yorkers will ad additionally be eligible. Public facing government and public employees, by the way, that's my great staff, not-for-profit workers who provide public facing services to New Yorkers in needs, essential in-person public facing building service workers. The CDC has issued guidance on gathering with others, as well as isolating, quarantining, testing once a person is fully vaccinating vaccinated. We are waiting to see what guidance is issued by New York City and state health departments, and I will provide updates as information becomes available. As we always tell people, we want to follow the best science we can here in New York City, regardless about what politicians are doing, or you hear politicians are doing other states. So I don't care if idiots in Texas are saying you don't need masks and you can do anything you want. You can't, we know that. We're New Yorkers, we're smart. Wear your mask, wear two masks apparently, keep at least six feet apart, only take your guard down with people who you've been living with or who you would know for a fact, haven't been anywhere where they could have gotten the disease since the last time you were with them. Don't assume just because you got vaccinated, you might not still be able to spread. They're still not 100% sure about that, but be smart. Wash your hands. Stop complaining about washing your hands. We're just going to do this right, and we're going to get through this. I know there's a lot going on in Albany. I'm sure that you've been following some of the stories and the scandals. I have told the governor I believe it is time for him to resign, that I no longer believe that he can do a credible job getting the work of the people done. But he's still there and he's still working and we will figure it out. I'm not going anywhere. Tonight, I am pleased to host this town hall on conspiracy theories with Dr. Richard Friedman, who is a professional, pro professor of clinical psychiatry and the director of psychopharmacology at Wild Cornell Medical College. And he's also a New York Times op-ed columnist. We've all been very impressed with his columns. Well, conspiracy theories and they are not a new phenomena, they seem to be more prevalent now than at any time I can remember in my life. I know from the questions submitted in advance to, for this event that the abundance of conspiracy thinking is causing many of you to be anxious and distressed. And some of you are looking for ways to address conspir conspiratorial thinking with your loved ones and friends. Dr. Friedman will discuss why humans are vulnerable to conspiracy theories, 
give us examples of some of the most dangerous theories in the environment, and he will also explain why they are hard to defeat and how we have to combat them. And again, we do have to combat them because they can freeze you in place where you don't know what to do, who to believe, whether you should even move or not. So with that, Ms. Dr. Friedman will give his presentation and then I'll moderate a Q&A portion of the town hall afterwards. Many, many of you gave us questions in advance. There will be a way later on to type in your questions um, to your devices. And I seriously doubt we will have enough time for everyone's questions. So welcome, Dr. Friedman. We're so glad to have you with us. Thank you so much, Senator. I am hoping that I am seen and heard at this moment. You are. Great. And that everybody can see my screen. Well, it's really a pleasure to be here this evening with you, even though it is virtual. And um, as the Senator said, what I'm going to talk to you about tonight is the topic of conspiracy theories, and in particular, why humans seem so vulnerable to them, why we are such suckers, not everybody, many of us, for these false and often lurid beliefs. And this is obviously a really important topic because it sits at the center of what has become an enormous public problem, which is you know, uh, alternative reality, fact-free arguments, um, fake news, um, and a swamp of misinformation and disinformation in the public marketplace. So first I thought it would be helpful just to um, talk about what conspiracy theories are so we're all on the same page. And a conspiracy theory basically is the belief that there is a powerful and hidden group of actors, could be organizations, could be an individual, that is secretly plotting with a very malevolent aim to control, hurt, or kill us, do something terrible to us. Now, I mean, some conspiracy theories are silly and funny and harmless. Um, I got a taste of one just last night. A colleague of mine emailed me and said that his sister believes the earth is flat and they haven't spoken for years. Um, that's an example of a silly conspiracy theory or that the moon landing was faked. Um, others are dangerous like the belief that vaccines might harm us because they can lead to disease outbreak and failure to contain a deadly pandemic like COVID. And still others are uh, very dangerous because they threaten the planet. So for example, people that don't believe that climate change is real, um, that's a human belief that could damage um, the environment to the point that um, our planet is in danger and the species may um, be in danger. So let me just see if I can take control of this. Um, so this is a common conspiracy theory these days, which is the coronavirus is manufactured by human beings. Think about that. Coronavirus manufactured by human beings. Um, not the result of a chance encounter between humans and animals, which it was in China. Um, and we know this because it's easy to go into the population of animals like bats and measure and see that the virus, the coronavirus actually exists in nature. Um, and also we know by comparing the genetic sequence of COVID in animals like bats to the COVID that made us sick, we know that they came from animals. Uh, they were not man-made. Um, they were not synthesized in a lab. So, the disease is quite real, and I just show this to you. This is data as of March 1st. In the United States, there have been 28,614,000 cases, more than a half a million deaths, with an overall case fatality rate of about 1.8%. Worldwide, it's about 114 million cases and 2.5 million deaths, with a case fatality of about 2.2%. We don't really know the true fatality because it's probably lower even than these numbers because the majority of people who get infected with this virus probably don't even have symptoms. But that is an enormous number of deaths and a source of you know, great grief and, and psychological pain in this country and around the world. Um, when you extend the conspiracy related to COVID, there are people that now believe the vaccine is dangerous. 
and there's a conspiracy about the vaccine such that 40% of Americans polled recently said they probably or definitely wouldn't take the vaccine. The one thing that actually could prevent a deadly disease. Some worry that there is a new technology in this vaccine, and there is. It's a form of M it's messenger RNA. Um, but you can't get COVID from the vaccine. It's not possible. It's not a virus. It's simply the information that the virus, uh, it's the information that allows the body to synthesize the protein and mount an immune response to the protein and protect you. Some believe the vaccine actually contains a trackable microchip as a part of a plot by Bill Gates for world domination. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. It sounds like science fiction. Uh, and of course it is. So conspiracy theories um, are actually fairly hard to defeat by argument. And one of the reasons is that sometimes it turns out to be true that we are manipulated by hidden actors, which after all is the core part of conspiracy theorizing. So think about it. Amazon, Facebook, Google, they collect our personal data without our consent and they monetize it and they make a zillion dollars off of your personal data without you knowing it. So the idea that they're, you know, that you are being secretly surveyed and controlled by powerful people and organizations is in fact true. Um, the challenge, of course, is distinguishing what is plausible, believable, from what is actually true and factual. And it's this last characteristic that distinguishes people that believe in conspiracies and those who know that they're not true. So here's another one. Stop the steal. I don't have to tell you what this one is. How could 70 to 80 percent of Republicans actually believe such a ridiculous lie? that Trump won the election, largely because uh, you know, humans are not hardwired for truth. We're hardwired for plausibility, for stories. And I'm going to get to this in a second, the psychology and the neuroscience behind that statement. We rely on intuition, which is often misleading, not on facts. We are drawn to data that confirms what we believe. We love to be confirmed in our beliefs. We look for data that confirms us, and then we just ignore things that contradict us. And this cognitive trait of human beings is a big problem in the, the age of digital media. Why? Because we're drowning in information. You can't open your computer, you can't turn on a TV without being flooded with information. So just as an example, I want you to look at this line. It's a famous um, illustration of an illusion. And tell me which line is longer? Now, most people will tell you the top line is longer. It feels longer to you, doesn't it? Your intuition is telling you that top line is longer, but they're actually the same. They are identical lengths, but your brain is fooled by this illusion. This is just an example, a very simple example where your intuition, in this case, your visual perception and your conclusion about the length of a segment is flat out wrong. Everyone gets this wrong, unless of course, they happen to know the answer. Um, so if we step back and think about how this came about and think about where we came from, we can understand it a little better. For the much of human history, we lived in very small hunter-gatherer groups and our survival depended on being able to anticipate danger and threats from outsiders, could be people, clans outside our own clan, who might plan to harm us. And if you had this trait and more of this trait, you were likely to survive because you would anticipate danger and threat. Now, in the present world, this kind of character trait, which is basically paranoia, in mild forms is really advantageous because you can anticipate danger and avoid it. Um, and it's advantageous in certain professions, current company, of course, excluded, like politics. Good politicians have a certain uh, amount of mild uh, ability, paranoia, to imagine the worst case scenario and that others, like their opponents, are out to get them. They are, actually. But aside from being able to detect danger and, and evolving to do that, we also evolved 
to make sense of the world. And that means to detect patterns and meaning. Um, and over millions of years, we evolved to very quickly look at the environment, detect patterns in the environment, and understand how events and things are causally related to each other. So as an example, uh, you know, when we were hominids, you know, millions of years ago in the savanna, a rustling sound in the grass, we learned might be a deadly predator. So when we hear a rustling sound, it's linked with that possible danger. It could just be the wind, of course. But you could imagine which assumption, which assumption would be more advantageous, the wind or a predator? Of course, a predator. You have to assume the worst. But this tendency to quickly see pattern and make sense and assume danger means that we are prone to making cognitive error, to making mistakes, like seeing connections and meaning where there isn't any at all. So when you're walking in the woods, you instinctively jump when you see a stick because it could be a snake. Better that than the other way around. You can always look back and correct yourself, but if you assume it's a stick and it's a snake, you might've been bitten. You get the idea. So it turns out that people who tend to believe conspiracy theories psychologically are more likely to see patterns and meaning in the environment around them where it does not exist. And there's a couple of experiments I wanna tell you about that demonstrate this that I think are very interesting. And in one study done by a Dutch psychologist, looks like the references were dropped off of the slide. I apologize for that. But in one study, subjects were asked if they believed before the study began, if they believed in a common conspiracy theory that the US government knew in advance about the 9-11 terrorist attack and did nothing to protect us. And then they were also asked about a fabricated conspiracy. And this one that the, the experimenters used was um, a story that the manufacturers of the popular energy drink Red Bull had doped their product with a substance that increased the desire for their product. I mean, it's a completely fabricated conspiracy. So having ascertained their belief in these two conspiracies, then they showed the subjects a random sequence of coin tosses, like throwing a coin up in the air and seeing if it's heads or tails. Now, they were shown a random sequence. The subjects did not know it was random, but it was random. It turns out the subjects who found an, a um, pattern in the random sequence were the very subjects who were more likely to believe in conspiracy theory. So that psychological trait drives the tendency to believe in conspiracy theories, seeing meaning, seeing order, seeing patterns where it doesn't exist. And then <clears throat> another study was done very similar, looking um, where they showed subjects two different kinds of paintings, a Jackson Pollock drip painting like this, rather chaotic, there's no structure here, or they showed them a painting by uh, Victor uh, Vasarle, um, and this is a highly structured, highly predictable pattern, okay? And what they found, and they did the same thing, they gave them conspiracy beliefs to begin with, and it turns out that um, the tendency to see structure in the random picture predicted belief in conspiracy theories, but there was no link for the structured painting. So all, if you take these two experiments together, basically, and boil it down, it suggests that conspiracy beliefs are driven by the tendency to see order and pattern in the world where none actually exists, like an illusion, a cognitive illusion. Which brings us to the greatest conspiracy of these days, the granddaddy of them all, QAnon. Um, the QAnon theory, um, you know, it's a group of conspiracy theories, but basically QAnon posits that there's a cabal of satanic pedophiles, they happen to be Democrats, of course, who are trying to take down the former president, and that there is a kind of coming storm, like an Armageddon, where the cabal will be exposed, the members will be punished, and America will be restored to true greatness. Sound familiar? It should. It's basically 
a mashup of millennialism uh, and old fashioned blood libel. You know, the Jews drink the blood of Christian children, except in QAnon, they take it one step further. In QAnon, they believe that these, these pedophiles don't drink the blood. They actually eat the children because the children's um, flesh contains a substance they believe uh, that these uh, pedophiles consume in order to stay young. I, I know it's hard to make this up. Uh, the believers have a claim to have special knowledge of the world that nobody else does. And um, in some ways, it's an exciting group probably to join because it looks like you know a set of violent video games. But really, if you think about it, it's 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 a form of know nothingism where um, if you've got a theory of everything, there's no need for facts, there's no need for knowledge or expertise. Basically, you're saying you understand everything and you know really what's going on behind the curtains and nobody else gets this but us in the club, QAnon. In fact, conspiracy theories, I think psychologically fill another role, which is they give people a false sense of certainty. You've got knowledge of the world. You understand how things are really working. But underneath it, actually, what drives this is that we don't like uncertainty. We really hate uncertainty. We can deal with good news that's certain or bad news that's certain, but what we can't deal with is uncertain news. Um, and one of the reasons is that we, we evolved such that situations that are uncertain um, usually contain some degree of danger or they might. And that feeling puts us on alert. And the experience of being alert means that we're anxious. So uncertainty brings about anxiety and humans instinctively don't like this. You know, if you think about it, um, uh, there are instances where people are awaiting a test like a biopsy to, to rule out a cancer. And we've done studies showing that when you're waiting to hear news, meaning you're uncertain, you don't know if it's good, you don't know if it's bad, just waiting makes people feel very bad. As soon as people get the news, whether it is good or whether it is bad, they feel better. Even if it's bad, they feel better knowing and being certain than they were waiting and being in a state of uncertainty. Which brings us to something that you wanna know about, which is how do you talk to a conspiracist? Um, obviously, you don't wanna say, you know, how can you be so stupid? How can you possibly believe you know, there's a cabal of pedophiles in a pizzeria. Uh, you know, what are you drinking? I mean, that won't work, obviously. So another way to do it is to think about introducing doubt. So my suggestion is be curious, be open-minded and withhold judgment and ask a lot of questions like, how'd you come up with that idea? Where did that come from? Explain this to me. What is the evidence for this idea? And is there anything that might change your mind? And you slowly introduce doubt and don't claim to know the truth. Even if you're right, keep it to yourself because that won't work. The key is doubt. And if someone is willing to consider an alternative explanation, you've won. Meaning they say, all right, you know, it's possible maybe there's another explanation. It's possible maybe Trump really didn't win the election. Uh, and yes, I, I suppose it's possible, et cetera. What can we do about conspiracy thinking? Well, as I explained earlier, the tendency to see order in things when not, no order and no pattern exists is predictive of conspiracy belief. And what we know is that people who tend to believe in conspiracies have lower levels of education. And it's not all that surprising after all, the more educated you are, the more you're more likely to have critical thinking about what you see and hear, and the more skeptical you're, you're likely to be, making it easier for you to check your intuitions that may be wrong, right? So you might look at that illusion I showed you before and say, 
I learned that these are the same. As a fact, I know they are the same. And I know I'm going to feel that they're the same. But I know my intuition is wrong on this. Um, I mean, we're, we're flooded every day with so much information, it's virtually impossible to fact check the world. But if as a society, we could foster the following cognitive reflex when we listen to information or read information, and that is to say, like a catechism, where did this come from? Based on what evidence? What does the author who wrote this hope to accomplish by telling it to me? Where did it come from based on what evidence and where does, what does the author want by telling me? And I think that our very survival depends on being able to, to counter this kind of thinking um, and distinguish fact from truth because you know, we are dealing with a pandemic, climate change, our ability to you know, lead our lives in accordance with science and fact will determine whether we survive or not as a species. So I'm just going to stop and um, and let the senator take over, and we can have a question and answer period. And thank you very much. Senator Kruger, you're on mute. Perhaps getting off of mute will make our conversation more efficient. Uh, <laughs> thank you. I appreciate your your presentation. I knew a few of those things, but not everything. Uh, so let's talk about a number of the questions we got here for you. How are new conspiracy th theories similar to traditional myths that humans of all societies and religious beliefs um, seem to have cemented for the groups while warning of the dangers of the others? So sort of the them and us, how does that play into it? That's a wonderful question. I think one of the roles, uh, I didn't go into this, but one of the roles that conspiracy theories serve is tribal identity, is you're a member of a group and you share a common set of beliefs. Like any group, you know, there's the in-group and the out-group. There are people who are QAnon and those who are outside, the losers to the QAnon group. Uh, and so we're a tribal species. You know, tribal membership could be, you know, you're a sports fan, you love the Yankees and you hate the Mets. I mean, it's a very fluid situation. The membership in which group you're in varies a lot on context and where you're gonna live. So you may live in New York, you'll be a, a Yankees fan. But if you move to you know, Boston, you might be a Red Sox fan. Uh, you know, we are very, very pliable when it comes to membership. But the one thing that seems to mark us is we tend to like to be in groups and we're tribal and conspiracy theories are like the glue that hold people together in some groups. So that can be a little bit disheartening because, so I grew up in the New York area, New York City since 1983. We always talk about ourselves as being a pluralistic society made up of people from everywhere in the world, every culture, every religion, every color, and that most of the time we seem to actually be able to live in harmony and peace and yet there is this tribalism and sometimes it explodes into some pretty ugly storylines as we have unfortunately seen more and more of in the last couple of years. What is, I mean, what can we learn from this so that we avoid those problems? I'm so glad that you said this. So, you know, I think that one of the key elements in dealing with the problem you just posed has to do with exposure to people who are different than we are. And let's say in New York City, you know, it's a very ethnically, racially, it's so diverse. Uh -huh. and you are used to being around people who are not like you. And so that we know actually decreases bias. Exposure to others decreases bias. So you have the experience of knowing, you know, a, a black person, a white person, an Asian person, a, you know, whatever. And you know them personally. So they're not categories. They're not indistinguishable categories. They're real people and you have real experiences with them. And that tends to mitigate, if not erase bias. If you go to parts of the country where they're more homogeneous in terms of socio demographics and ethnicity and race, 
you see higher levels of fear of strangers. And, um, you know, this is some of the differences, group differences between, you know, the Democratic constituents and, you know, Republican constituents. And it, and it tracks with, um, you know, how much exposure people have to others. I think there are places in the country where that's a much greater problem because of the, you know, demographic homogeneity, mm -hmm. lack of exposure. I sometimes feel that way when I talk to my colleagues from upstate New York who, you know, will actually say things like, well, I never met someone who was an X or a Y. I yeah. go, that's impossible. I mean, you know, you just live on a block in New York City and you know the alphabet easily. You know, you've met everybody, you've been exposed to so many different, you know, people from different countries and cultures. And let's face it, the best part about New York City is the diversity of food. You name a food from somewhere you can, other than during the pandemic, you can find a restaurant that serves it. Right. Um, you know, I completely agree. I, I was on the subway recently and I thought to myself, here we are crowded together again on the subway. And I miss that. Everybody was different, young and old and black and white and, you know, every group and people get along. There were no riots. Yeah. There were no terrible things happening on that subway. Yes, occasionally there's violence, but by and large, people do get along who have contact with one another. Exactly. So psychologists, sociologists, social psychologists um, addressing this issue. You know, you have a column in the New York Times talking about this. We, I even think the government is paying more attention. We have, you know, President Biden now who's talking about bringing a sociologist into the White House. Um, what else should we be doing to wake ourselves up to being more self-aware, more willing to talk about this with friends and family and break down um, these conspiracies so that they don't freeze us or prevent us from moving forward with our lives? Wow, well, that if I knew the answer to that question, <laughs> Uh, that would be that would be quite something. I mean, that I would say, you know, it's probably the case that if you were thinking of what has the greatest bang for the buck in terms of dealing with tribalism, conspiracy, mongering, and things like this, the question itself comes from someone who's probably skeptical and educated. And my advice is, to have more exposure to different people, to break down the barrier between us and them. Um, no amount of education, no amount of diversity training or you know, uh, you know, unconscious bias training is going to change that. What I think will change it is the experience. And, and I think, and I, and I am hopeful because of the democratic demographic changes in the country, young people tend to be more tolerant than older people. In more contact with others. Um, so I don't think it's quite as bleak. A sociologist in the White House, great idea, but it can't, it can't make up for what's missing on the ground, which is contact. Mm -hmm. So you talked about, um, and we talk about it all the time now in my office, but you know, people's fear of taking the COVID vaccine, um, myths that have been spread, conspiracy conspiracies that have been spread. Some people are asking through the chat. So is this new? And I want to shout out no, because I had anti-vaxxers chasing me around the state capitol two years ago before we even knew what COVID was. And it was just people who didn't want to get their children vaccinated from diseases we've known about forever and been vaccinating around. So help me understand, because I really worry about this anti-vaccine, false information about vaccine, almost subculture, because it's not just uneducated people. I found that a disproportionate share of the anti-vaccine community, at least pre-COVID, um, were what I'd call 
suburban soccer moms from the suburbs. Oh. And I just, like, they did. These are women who are smart people. They probably went to college. They are taking responsibility for their families and their children. And yet they read something in a fashion magazine that says, you know, Jenny McCarthy says you can't get your children vaccinated. And suddenly everybody's, don't get your children vaccinated. What do we do about this? Yeah, well, that's a huge problem. I mean, look, I'm a big believer in science and you know, rational thinking. And some of it can be dealt with effectively by providing information. But I think that the group of anti-vaxxers is probably different populations in this whole group. There are probably anti-vaxxers who have you know, ideological opposition to the notion of, you know, a, a, a pharmaceutical, a foreign material being injected into their body. And information will not be that helpful with those people or people who have a very strong religious belief about something like this. I mean, I think you go for the low hanging fruit first with information about what the vaccine is and isn't. So to deal with misinformation, the best way to do it is with what's called a truth sandwich, which was coined by George Lakoff, the linguist. You basically start off with a fact when you're dealing with a lie, like the vaccine is dangerous. You say, you know, the vaccine can save millions of lives because it's an effective, safe way of protecting yourself against coronavirus. Here's the stuff in the sandwich in the middle. But people who are afraid of the vaccine and some people actually are spreading rumors about the vaccine that it's dangerous, that is wrong. We know that scientifically it's wrong. And then the other part of the sandwich. But the fact is, let's focus on the fact. The fact is more than half a million Americans have died of this disease. And this is something that is safe and effective and everybody should get it. It has really be that simple. Should be that simple. So I assume, say for someone like me, a politician who actually has the ability to be relatively prescriptive and pass laws saying, no, you have to get vaccinated, at least in the following situations. Do you think that's, it's, it's not addressing the conspiracy or the lack of information. It's just sort of, I don't know, bulldozing over it for a for a reason. What well, you, you can make a very, very persuasive public health argument that you know people who are opposed to the vaccine represent a threat to others around them. So your freedom ends where you're about to make me in, in put me at risk. You know, so you could say, look, you, you we can't make you take a vaccine. We really hope you would, and we want you to. But if you don't take a vaccine, you can't join society in the way everybody else can. You can't go to the movies. You can't go to a restaurant. We're gonna insist you show proof of vaccination. I mean, the Israelis are doing this, for example. Is that, that's a reasonable social position, I think. It's, it's to say the onus is on you. We will not allow you to harm others. If you wanna jump off a cliff, that's one thing, but you can't take others with you. Well, that's how I would explain it to the anti-vaxxers who would be saying to me, who said to me, you're preventing my children from going to school. And I would respond, no, you're preventing them from going to school. If you get them vaccinated, they can go to school. Why should my children have to get vaccinated if I don't want them to? Because you don't have the right to harm other people. Exactly, that's why I say I have to worry about all the children, not just your children. Yeah. So we're making a decision from a public health perspective that for the best interests of all of us, we all have to do this. And if you're not gonna participate, then no, your kids don't get to go to the playground and they don't get to school. And what I found really interesting, and it's a whole movement out there, teenagers who were making the decision to go ahead and get vaccinated or try to get vaccinated, even though their parents didn't support it, because the teenager would get to a certain age and realize, I'm missing out on all these things that I think I need and my yeah. parents are wrong. And so I'm gonna see if I can just get around them to get what is actually needed for me for my health and my education. And some states have passed laws saying, 
teenagers are allowed to go around their parents for these things. And other states are still, you know, dealing with the dilemma of that. But I don't know if I was a doctor and I had a 13 year old show up and say, I've read why this is happening and I want my vaccines. I would say you're old enough to make that decision. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I think it's really interesting because as a group, teenagers are much, much more likely to embrace risk. They're risk takers, they're novelty seeking. So it's not surprising to me that they would be more willing to you know, brush off the hypothetical risk of something like a vaccine. Plus they're intensely social <laughs> and they right. don't want to be locked away. So right. this is gonna protect them, of course. And you know, we usually think parents make decisions in the best interests of their kids. It's not always true. And in this case, if you're an anti-vaxxer, it's definitely not true. Right. So we're living in a world with people suffering from all kinds of mental illnesses and mental stresses. And more and more we know about different types of disorders and sociopathies. Is there a correlation between being someone who falls into believing conspiracy theories and being paranoid and actually being mentally ill? Or are these all separate things? It's a really fascinating question. Uh, first of all, there's almost no data about it because um, conspiracy theories that are, you know, the kinds of studies I was talking about this evening are studies of, you know, normal, you know, pop, normal controls, non-psychiatric group. Um, it wouldn't surprise me that in certain kinds of problems, you're more likely to see conspiracy thinking, especially in people who may tend to have psychotic like thoughts. Um, but I don't think that conspiracy thinking by itself means that a person is mentally ill. I would not make that assumption. And I think it's probably wrong. I think most of them, if, if I had to guess, it's not mental illness that correlates with conspiracy thinking. It's lack of critical thinking and the lower level of education. Hmm. So we did have someone write in um, that they have a client who's married to someone who's become convinced um, that his belief in conspiracy theory of the elites taking over the world and controlling everyone is the absolute truth and that the attack on the White House was a plant by elites to attack Trump, and that vaccine is government control and dangerous. So that would be a challenge if that was your spouse. Um, so my client is speaking about nonstop about their teen, uh, sorry, my client speaks nonstop about this to their teens and to their to the spouse. And she's very worried that he might actually become dangerous or violent based on the emotional sort of hysteria level of his paranoid conspiracy theories. Is that a step that you see with people at all? I mean, is there a reason to fear that it's going to turn into something dangerous well, for the rest of the family? January 6th was a demonstration of the power, a perfect storm of a demagogue who you know, essentially incited a violent attack on government, on the institution, you know, in a group of people who did have conspiracy beliefs. So he kindled this you know, bonfire. So this is an individual acting on his own, presumably, unless he's a member of a group. And frankly, from the anecdote you told me, he may or may not have a mental illness, I always say in a case like this, it's worth having an evaluation because in what you think might just be a plain old conspiracy theory may be masquerading as an episode of a psychiatric illness. I wouldn't assume that's the case. Mm -hmm. So you don't necessarily think that everybody who falls into these conspiracy, paranoid, MAGA kinds of things are actually psychiatrically ill and uh, in need of psychiatric services? I don't know because no one has studied them. So it's an interesting question, a really important question. I think there's a mix of different populations in there. 
I'm sure there are some people who have psychiatric illnesses and personality disorders mixed in with them, but I, I would doubt, and we need good epidemiologic studies of this population. Um, but you can imagine that, you know, if you believe in conspiracy theories, you may not be the first one to raise your hand to, to, to volunteer for a survey about your mental status. So, you know, it's gonna be hard to study. Okay, so let's talk about the other side of it. The people who are watching this going on aren't falling into believing this, but they have enormous anxiety because they're seeing what, you know, their society break down or what they think is their society breaking down. Certainly those of us watching what was happening in Washington, D.C. on January 6th, we were literally holding our breath. Were, there, were they cooing our government? Was our society completely breaking down. We were wondering, would the police and the military be on the right side of it or would they would jump to the other side? What was everyone thinking and then doing? And we're still trying to figure out who did what when and who knew what when. But what about people who now still find they have enormous anxiety because of just living through you know, that day and sitting and watching um, the TV and then following up with the newspaper stories. You know, how do they stop feeling overwhelmed by this alternative world that people they know and associate with have adopted? So I would, yes, of course, I can understand that reaction. You know, we were right on the brink of going over the cliff. And so it's almost like a near-death experience, right? I mean, we almost lost American democracy, or so it seemed. We were this close. I mean, you know, it was not just the attack on the Capitol, but it was a president who was planning to throw the election into a contingent, you know, situation and steal it. So normally, you know, when you face a threat, you get really scared, you get really upset about it. And then when the threat passes, you calm down because the danger is gone. But the question is asking, is the danger gone? And in some ways, you know, you have to say realistically, well, it may be at the moment, you know, calm down because we have a president who seems like a reasonable adult who believes in science and fact, and, you know, he's a kind, empathic, compassionate person but that doesn't change the, all the other people and all the conditions that were there before. So I would say, yes, it's a reason to remain alert, but if you can't calm down and, um, and, and see it as something that's sort of in the rear view mirror, it's not acute, it's not a crisis at the moment, then it's worth going to talk to somebody. Because mm -hmm. you should be able, once, once the acute crisis is over, to think about political action, to do all the things that you would normally do to shore up a democracy, become involved, become engaged in the process and try to strengthen democracy and do everything you can to make what just happened impossible. Okay, so maybe you're now gonna think I'm a conspiracy theorist, but I'm just curious um, because I keep reading different articles that talk about how all the different software programming and smartphone programming and games and online gambling that all these very brilliant computer people are getting us to spend most of our days and nights doing is actually reprogramming our brains and that the neurons are actually developing differently for the younger generation because they literally are just in all of this all the time and that it's making us think differently and do different things. Am I now a conspiracy theorist or is it possible that all of this outside stuff is actually driving our brains to work differently and to approach things differently? No, I don't think that's a conspiracy theory. That's a reasonable hypothesis for which there's zero data, I wanna point out, however, and it has been studied and I could, we could talk about that, but you know, it, it's, it's an intuitive 
speculation like, okay, we're subjected to a new influence. We're easily influenced to start with. Why isn't it possible that all of this gaming and exposure to digital technology won't change our brain? Well, we're pretty tough creatures. We've evolved over millions of years. And you know there is a limit to what kinds of external influences can actually go in and have an effect on our brain. There are all kinds of gates and sort of internal mechanisms that limit the effect of exposure like this. Drugs are different, drugs to go directly into the brain, but as of yet, video games do not. So, you know, people have studied this and attempted to study it. And actually no one has been able to demonstrate that there's any long-term change in the structure or function of adolescent brains, for example, among kids who game and whether the dose of gaming is higher, nothing. So. I don't think it's a conspiracy theory. It's just a common speculation and I don't think we need to worry about it. But I would worry about something else, which is all of that influence is being done in order to mold our behavior and monetize it. And there's no privacy. So everything you're doing is being tracked and all your preferences and all your desires and all your you know, choices are being tracked and recorded and monetized without your consent. That to me is a huge problem. I have a bill in Albany to tax the companies for collecting it and monetizing us. It's quite controversial. Um, and all the companies are like, no, you don't mean me. No, you don't mean me, but it's all of them. You're absolutely right. Everything you do on a computer is then being collected up by lots of somebodies and they are selling that data and using that data for their business models and i don't know how to stop it so i thought at least we could tax it um or to... force them to give everybody a cut well that's After true all, it's our we are we are the raw material on which they're making this huge profit or maybe um you know there should be an, when it comes to privacy a opt-in the default assumption must be no, unless people say affirmatively, yes, I give you that information. I have a feeling that that horse, that horse is out of the barn and we've all signed away our rights like 4 million times by now because, and, and we, you and I know it because everyone knows it. When you go on to a new app or a new just website and give them your email address, and they say, okay, now you'll be a member of whatever. There's some screen that you'll never read with, yeah. with tiny little print that says <laughs> you have now handed over everything but your firstborn children, right, yeah. to us by yes. going online. Yes. Um, and I just don't know that we can reverse that, but, but you were right, there is no privacy today in a, in a really radical way. I mean, my, my mother uh, passed away a couple of years ago but she used to be indignant if I'd say, oh, look, mom, there you are on the internet. You were in such and such picture. She goes, I'm not on the computer. I have nothing to do with the computer. I don't even know how to use one. I'm not on the internet. I go, no, but your picture is. You were at an event, someone took your picture and put it up. And she was like, they don't have the right to do that. And I just sort of laughed. I was like, oh, you have no idea. You know, and she would make me look her up. And she'd be like, but I've never said yes to any of this. And I've never touched a computer. Right. Like, hello, not to be conspiratorial people, but if you're here with us tonight, you know how to use a computer. So hopefully you do know how much information there is out there about us and how it is being used in lots of different ways. All right, so this may have nothing to do with conspiracy theories, but apropos of politicians thinking their, opponent, their opponents are out to get them, or it being true, what about ranked, vote, ranked choice voting? Can that help with this? I don't know if you know, doctor, but New York City is starting this model um, of ranked choice voting, where when we go in to vote in June in the primary, the next big election in New York City, while we're used to just checking a box for somebody on the piece of paper, now we will actually be asked to give our top four or five, I think it's five preferences in order, one, two, three, four, five. Right. So if the mayoral race st stays at 40 people, 
which is a little overwhelming to me, by the way. I, I can't possibly study 40 people. But <laughs> if the mayor's race studies of 40 people, I can rate my top five. And there's a certain theory of this that because everybody is hoping to be your number two or number three, if they can't be your number one, that everybody will actually be nicer during elections um, to each other and won't try to attack each other and won't try to provide false information um, that they can get shot down on because they're still trying to romance you to be that, that you know you can be number two or three if you're not their favorite. Do you yeah. think, what do you think of all this? I think, I mean, I like, I like the idea of ranked voting and I have heard about it and I've seen models that show that if you do that, you end up with results that are more kind of representative of voters. And so voters don't feel as disenfranchised and angry about the strange outcomes. So maybe to that extent, it's probably better because it lowers emotional temperature, not just of candidates, but of voters. And it produces an outcome that's probably better. Maybe. I mean, I think that's one of the arguments about it. Yeah. That it does. And that it also even, like, there's been a frustration for years that people want to go in and actually vote none of the above. You know, they just like, no, we don't like anyone. And that ranked choice actually sort of, since it gives a broader universe of people who might be on that ballot, it gives you a way to, you know, tie things into your own identity more and who you actually think represents you more. Um, so, oh, I'm getting a question. How much money would my bill raise if we tax online data collection? <laughs> I don't know. I've got the tax and finance department trying to do that for me right now. So thank you. Probably a lot of money. Um, so, uh, but jumping back to the question for the um, doctor, you know, I do think it will be really interesting to see over time if we're electing different kinds of people into office. Um, because I've always said New Yorkers seem to like really aggressive executives. Um, they like tough executives. And some women in politics have talked about that maybe there's a disadvantage because people prefer a tough and aggressive person in an executive position. And when women act tough and aggressive in a campaign mode, um, they are sometimes thought badly of in ways that men would not be thought badly of if they behaved the same way. Absolutely. We saw that with Hillary Clinton. Yeah. Just rank misogyny. And do you think conspiracies tie into sexism um, and those issues in our society? I'm thinking about that. Um, I'm sure that they do. It's just most of the conspiracies that I'm aware of focus more on groups like race and ethnicity, um, not, not gender. Um, but that would be an obvious one. And in part, it may be because these are like visual cues that mark people as different. Gender doesn't as much. Mm -hmm. um, so actually with just, ooh, just a few more minutes left, so on, on race and on how, if we don't get to know each other, we're more likely to have stereotypes about each other and falsehoods and conspiracies. There's been a lot of discussion about issues of New York for all its diversity, having some of the most de segregated neighborhoods and schools in the country. And if we fix that, do you think that would help us with our general interrelationship issues? In the long run, yes. In the short run, probably you'll see a flare up of tribalism and not in my backyard. And, and that has certainly been a pattern now for a while around the question of just a couple of the what's called high test stakes high schools. Yeah. Um, and, and by the way, the flare ups aren't necessarily so tribal. So even though these testing high schools have a disproportionately low percentage of young people of color outside of Asian Americans going to them. 
um, some of the most adamant supporters of them, for example, are elected officials of color who went to them and don't want to see them go away because they see it as a model of what was successful for them and help them, you know, move up and out of their poor communities and their poor schools. So right, even though they're, as you point out, I mean they're outliers. They're very small number of them. Exactly. Right. So that's the problem. Mm -hmm. So this is these are challenges for the 40 people running for mayor as we speak. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, I'm just looking at okay, last question, I think. Not a single staff member in our New York City cooperative building is willing to take the vaccine, despite the fact they all come from the hardest hit neighborhoods. What can we do to try to convince them that it's in their best interest and in their community's best interest to get vaccinated? Wow. You mean you're talking about the co-op board? I guess it was a co-op board or just a member of the building who's writing in saying this, this is the problem. Um, well, I mean, Again, I mean, if, if they are in your community and you live in the building with them, um, and I have a, a real interest in this kind of thing because I happen to be the president of the co-op board where I live. Okay. Um, so I, I think you, you talk to people um, and you say, hey, what's, what's going on? What do, you, what do you think about this? And, um, you know, I, I'm just, curious what your thoughts are about the vaccine and try to understand what it is that they are acting on. It may be something simple that you can help them with. Maybe they're worried about it. Maybe they're worried they're gonna have a bad reaction. Maybe they've heard something about it that you can dispel and give them information about and change their mind. You might encounter someone who's a fanatic who can't be budged, but it's definitely, it's much better to investigate it than it is to speculate about it. Go find out. Mm -hmm. Well, I know that I would like to thank you for being with us tonight. And I know that everybody who has been listening to us tonight is very appreciative of your time and your work. Um, I just wanna say that I learned so much on, on all these events, but I think particularly Dr. Friedman's sort of warmth and being able to translate it all into you know, language that we understand and experiences that we understand is so valuable. Uh, so as we close down tonight, I want to announce that our next event will take place Thursday, March 18th from 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. The event is part of my um, sort of panel series on being mortal. Um, we do senior roundtable series every year, and this year our theme has been being mortal. And we're gonna focus next Thursday on current research and practice regarding the use of psychedelics. Oh, we could invite Dr. Friedman back. Um, psychedelics to ease end of life distress. Finally, with all of the attention focused on being vaccinated, please continue to get tested, especially if you experience symptoms, or if you're exposed to someone who has had the virus. And I know there's been enormous frustration for weeks and months now about it being so difficult to get the vaccine, but it is becoming easier. There are more options, there are more vaccines. Um, and if my office can help you with that, please reach out to us. I think I have staff who spend much of their days helping people get um, reservations for the vaccine, but it is getting more accessible and easier to do. And don't forget, we're not out of the woods yet. There are several new variants of the virus that are spreading in New York City. So again, as we opened up, wear two masks or a K95 mask, continue to social distance, wash your hands frequently, continue to follow other COVID safety practices and I know everybody's desperate to go back out in the world and to go to restaurants. And I don't want the restaurants to stay closed or them to lose any more money. But I urge you, buy the food and bring it home. Have it delivered. I'm still not convinced there's a safe way to sit at a restaurant with your mask off, 
talking to people while you're eating and coughing and chewing and the ventilation system is absorbing spittle and sending it back out to other people in the restaurant. So I'm a little controversial that way because some people are like, hooray, we can go back to the restaurants. I'm saying eat their food, just eat it at your home. So until the next time, thank you so much everybody for joining me and thank you to my staff for pulling this all together as always. Good night.